Good morning, friends, and welcome to Court Street Online. My name is Josh, and I'm one of the pastors here. And I'm really excited today to continue this sermon series that we've just got into last week on the parables. We've entitled it, Imagine If. Now, if you watched the broadcast last week, you heard how we talked about the parables. And you've heard how we uh, describe the parables the way that Jesus taught them as indirect communication. You know, the opposite of that is direct communication. And so to illustrate that, I've brought with me my fedora and my pipe. <laughs> Why did I bring these things? Well, how many of you are familiar with the show Dragnet? You know, uh, Sergeant Joe Friday is perhaps one of the best examples I can think of of direct communication. So imagine yourself in that show, imagine yourself with this detective, and he says, all right, ma'am, from the beginning, just the facts, just the facts. <laughs> all right, there's my, uh, there's my impression for the day of Joe Friday and the idea of direct communication. But, you know, in our culture today, we're really familiar with direct communication, aren't we? It's what we hear in the news. We get our emails and we have the subject line. It's just as direct as possible. Um, we get it in social media these days. It seems like all that we get are these news bites and just short statements. In fact, I learned this week, if, if you, uh, anybody get on Twitter ever, I learned that Twitter increased the 140 character to 280 and that was like four years ago that they did that, so it's news to me. But our, our culture loves the idea of direct communication, and certainly direct communication is valuable, isn't it? It's, it gets the point across quickly, it's short, it's direct, it's certain, it has a certain value. But in this sermon series, we're exploring the way that Jesus taught, that he taught in, in parables, in this indirect way. And honestly, sometimes this was confusing to the audience. Sometimes this was actually frustrating to his disciples. Um, using stories and illustrations and common everyday examples, Jesus was unveiling the kingdom of God. And he was inviting people to imagine this kingdom in a brand new way, in a way that was different than they understood the kingdoms. He was imagining if, imagine if the kingdom of God looks like this. So last week, we introduced this really great quote. And um, I've highlighted a different section of this quote today because it illustrates and relates to the parable that we're going to be unpacking today in Matthew chapter 13. Here's the quote. It comes from uh, Klein Snodgrass, who is a professor of uh, New Testament theology. And he says this, Direct communication is important for conveying information. But learning is more than information intake. Especially if the learner is someone who already thinks that they understand. <laughs> Let's just think about that for a minute. If the learner already thinks they understand. But indirect communication finds a way into the back window to confront a person's view of reality. A parable's ultimate aim is to draw in the listener, to awaken insight, to stimulate the conscience, and to move to action. As indirect communication, it's, uh, it seems that in his parables, Jesus maybe was hiding his message, you know? And at the same time, though, as he was hiding this message, he was unveiling something new, something even surprising that would often surprise his audience. Parables have this subversive nature where the truth about God, the truth about the kingdom that Jesus was talking about, uh, was not revealed in an in-your-face direct way, but it was one, a way that kind of sneaks up on you where the truth is like, oh, aha, I get it. There's a few creative ways that I've, in studying for this series, that I've discovered that different people have put this, okay? So we enjoy... Uh, the people in Portland uh, that put together the Bible project. And this is the way that they talk about the parables. They say that the parables both concealed and revealed, or conceal and reveal. Uh, Soren Kierkegaard said it this way, that the parables deceive a person into the truth. <laughs> that seems kind of sneaky, doesn't it? Deceives a person into the truth. 
And our professor Snodgrass says it this way. The parables hide in order to reveal. What a unique way that Jesus communicated. What a unique way to get to the heart. One of the beautiful things about parables is that the more that we meditate on them, the more that we allow them to sink into our soul, the more truth is revealed to our hearts. I think of the great theologian. You've probably heard of him. His name is Shrek. Yeah, he said it this. Ogres are like onions. They both have layers. <laughs> Maybe uh, Shrek would say parables are like onions. They have these layers. And so think of it that way. Think of it as, as layers of truth that is being unveiled. Now to set up how we're going to look about at this parable today, the parable of the sower, one of the most famous parables in Scripture, I'm going to use another parable of sorts, a modern parable, okay? <laughs> now, Jesus told the parable of the sower to talk about parables. So this is like a parable about the parable about the parables. I don't know. Maybe you're, you're as confused as I am right now. But I would like just to set this up as an example. I brought with me some tools. Do you recognize what these tools are? My friend Henry who actually comes here to Court Street, he has this hobby of panning for gold. And he is the one that actually allowed me to borrow his tools for an illustration today. Now, what I've learned about um, panning for gold, I've all, only, the only thing I've learned, I've learned from Henry. <laughs> um, I haven't actually been myself, but he was telling me about these unique tools. Did you know that the first people that panned for gold um, in the 1800s in, in the United States, some around here in Oregon, they used pie pans, just a metal pie pan. And they would put some, they'd get their shovel, they'd put some dirt in there, and they'd swirl it around and try to look for pieces of gold. But this is a, is a modern day um, pan, and it's all plastic. This is a plastic uh, shovel and a plastic uh, bowl here. And you'll notice if you, if you look up close that there's actually ridges in this one. And what's really interesting, what Henry was telling me, was that as you swirl the dirt around and it sloshes out. The lighter weight elements like sand and other um, rocks that are not as heavy will actually pour out of the bowl, but these ridges will catch the heavier elements, elements like iron, elements like what you're looking for, gold. And you'll be able to find that. And so as I think about this idea of panning for gold, we're going to pan for gold in the parables. All right, we're going to spend some time and, and sift through them and sift through the layers to see what is the truth uh, about the kingdom that comes uh, in, into our hearts and into our lives from these awesome parables. So let's begin to sift through the parable of the sower, shall we? And as we're sifting through the parables, the first thing that comes to mind for me is that it begins with the original audience begins with the original audience. You know, it's important when you're studying the parables to realize that anytime you read a parable, you must first go to the, to the story where Jesus first told it. Look at the audience. Look at, what Jesus, look at who they were and what Jesus was trying to say to them about the kingdom. And so we're going to look at the original context and we're going to look at this passage from Matthew 13 where Jesus' disciples, remember last week we talked about Matthew 13, Jesus' disciples asked him, they said, Jesus, why do you speak in parables? Well, this parable of the sower is the one that he had just told that uh, incited that question from them. And so we're going to look at that. Now, to put us in the story, I want you to imagine yourself in the story for just a minute. Imagine that you're a character on that lake shore that day that is listening to Jesus speak on the shores of the Lake of Galilee. Imagine that you're, let's just say, I don't know, a farmer. Okay, And you've heard from others that this man from Galilee has been speaking and that he sounds like the prophets of old. This Jesus has language that harkens back to the ancient prophets of Isaiah. He sounds like Jeremiah. Even hints of his, his examples sound like Amos even. And you're thinking, wow, he's speaking about the kingdom of God. Um, I've also heard that Jesus has great power. I've heard of these healings that this teacher has done. I've even heard that he's raised someone from the dead. And this sounds pretty exciting to you. So 
Remember, you're a farmer, so all of your survival depends on you working your fields and you take a very precious day off. You take a day off to go listen to this teacher and you want to see if everything that they've been saying is true. You finally get down to the Lake of Galilee and you'll notice that that the lake there has a kind of a natural amphitheater, but there's such a large crowd that you can't get close to this rabbi, this master teacher. Uh, it, you know, back in, in that time, it was customary for the teaching to be actually opposite of what we do. Here, when we come to church, we, the, the audience sits and the speaker stands. But in that day, Jesus, the teacher, would have sat and the audience would have been standing. And so here, you as this farmer, you're trying to see, you're trying to see, where, what is Jesus saying? I can't really hear him. You notice that there's some commotion down by the shore. And some of his disciples have gotten a boat. And they, Jesus has gotten into it. And he's floating out into the lake. And then you realize, oh, this is pretty brilliant. Jesus can sit in the boat just a few, uh, a few yards from the shore and use the natural amplification of the water and that natural amphitheater. And everyone can hear him. And it's this amazing time as you listen to Jesus talk and you listen to him tell this story, this parable of the sower. You get to hear it firsthand. And as you listen to him share about the kingdom, you start to understand, wow, there's something powerful about this man. There's something powerful about his story. And I don't really understand exactly what he's getting at, but I believe that the kingdom, if if the kingdom is coming, just as he said, I'm excited about that. You can feel it welling up within your chest. You can un- think and, and, um, and just dream a little bit about what it would look like for Israel to be, you know, set free from their oppressors and restored to glory. And it's, it's, it's an excitement that is within you. And then you hear Jesus' teaching. He tells this parable. Let's look at it together. It's in Matthew chapter 13. It says this, And then he, meaning Jesus, told them many things in parables, saying, A farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path. And the birds came and they ate it up. And some fell on rocky places where it did not have much soil. It sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow. But when the sun came up, the plants were scorched. And they withered because they had no root. Other seed fell among the thorns, which grew up and choked the plants. Still other seed fell on good soil, where it produced a crop, a hundred, sixty, or thirty times what was sown. Then Jesus says this great phrase, Whoever has ears, let them hear. Boy, imagine with me, if you would, who some of the characters might have been that were in the crowd that day listening to Jesus speak. Perhaps there were some that were just children. They had come because, honestly, they get excited about Jesus. He spends time with children. He loves children, and so children are drawn to him. Maybe it was some in the crowd were religious leaders who were skeptical of Jesus' message. In fact, they found his message to be threatening to them. And so they wanted to come and check out and make sure that everything was on the up and up. Maybe they could even catch Jesus in his words. Maybe there were some that, honestly, they just came for the show. (laughs) They wanted to see Jesus do some great healing. What they didn't realize that day was that Jesus' story of the parable was, in the original context, he was talking about them. He was talking about that he had come to announce the kingdom and that the kingdom was going to be found in his ministry, that he was beginning the kingdom of God. And he was speaking to people that some were hearing, some were We're not. So as we take this parable, take this parable of the sower, we're going to put it back here in our in our gold pan. We're going to sift out some more, see what else comes. Because that's that's the great thing about a parable, isn't it? The the more that we look at it from different angles, the more truth we can find, the more the the those heavier truths sink in and we can discover them. And when I sift through the parable, I number two, reveal the heart of the kingdom of God. Sifting through the parables reveals the heart of the kingdom of God. Now this particular parable is a pretty unique parable because it's one of the only ones in 
the Gospels where Jesus actually gives an explanation. Often he would just give a parable and just let it hang out there. But in this particular one, we have a really unique sense of what Jesus was doing because he gives the explanation. Listen then to what the parable of the sower means. When anyone hears the message about the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what was sown in their heart. This is the seed sown along the path. The seed falling on rocky ground refers to someone who hears the word and at once receives it with joy. But since they have no root, they only last a short time. When trouble or persecution comes because of the word, they quickly fall away. The seed falling among the thorns refers to someone who hears the word, but the worries of this life and the deceitfulness of wealth choke the word, making it unfruitful. But the seed falling on good soil refers to someone who hears the word and understands it. This is the one who produces a crop, yielding 160 or 30 times what was sown. Don't you love it? Now that Jesus has given the explanation, it's all clear. It makes perfect sense to me, right? <laughs> well, what's funny is Bible scholars have been dissecting this for literally hundreds of years, well, since Jesus spoke these words. And there have been different ways of interpreting even Jesus' explanation. For instance, uh, in the tradition that I grew up in, the church tradition, there was this idea that uh, we should interpret this very literally and Make, make it like an allegory. So everything in the story refers to something that I understand in my modern understanding of, you know, how Christianity works. In other words, it worked out like this. Like, so I kind of overanalyzed it. And I said, well, the word, what that means is the Bible. Okay? That, that's what that means. And soil, well, those are people that, you know, hear the Bible read to them and the sower well originally that's God but then I kind of start to play that role because I'm I'm the one who spreads the word you know out to people and the crop what happens at the end is the amount of people who respond to that and are converts you know for Christ and this was kind of this understanding that this is what it would what it meant for our lives and that we had this job to do which was to sow the seed and you know what? All those are good things. They really are. I, I think about um, this one particular ministry that they had a whole ministry of printing Bibles and making sure people that didn't have them had them, uh, had those Bibles to read. And that's a great thing. Or the idea of, you know, um, getting the word out and people converting to Christ. All that's great things. But yet that was just kind of a, a shallow understanding of what Jesus was saying, really. And the more that I, that I sift through it, the more I realize that it's more than that. It's more than just this complicated allegory um, that makes me feel obligated, you know, that I have to do something, that I have to somehow get the word out there. You know, in fact, there are some dangers to that because when I think of soil as people, when I think of people as, as soil, it's kind of like, well, this is the people that are in and this is the people that are out. Or when I think about the word meaning the Bible, well, that doesn't really make sense because, I mean, the Bible wasn't even around, you know, during Jesus' time, or at least the way we understand it. And, uh, you know, those type of things can, can make it complicated. They can make it complicated. Um, but what it is really is that when I think about uh, the, the heart of the kingdom is this, is that I'm invited to hear. That's what Jesus said. Anyone who has ears, hear. And I'm allowed to have the heart of the kingdom take root in the soil of my life and produce a harvest. Well, that gives me a couple of questions. You might even be thinking of them. What is the harvest? What is, uh, what is the fruit that is being produced? And so, let's do it again. Let's put this parable parable back in our pan let's sift through it let's find let's mine out those little those little nuggets that are in there and this is really the last thing that I want to talk about and this is this is that sifting through the parables leads me into personal reflection just like when I'm sifting through uh, dirt looking for valuable elements like gold um, 
the richer things start to come uh, to, to my attention as I sift through it and as I uh, look into what it, what it means on a deeper level. I love what N.T. Wright says about this. He says it much better than I have, and I'll just uh, quote him here. It said, he said this, Many of Jesus' parables are like mazes. He uses an example as well. He uses the example of a maze. Designed to challenge the listeners to work it out for themselves. How to get to the heart of things. There's this invitation in the parables for us to dwell upon them, to meditate upon them, to continue to work them out in our lives, to find those valuable truths for our lives. And so when I think about this, I I think of it very personally. Very personally. What is the seed that's being sown in my life? What is the seed of the kingdom? How are the different types of soil, how are they evident um, in my experience. Now, Scripture is full of imagery of, you know, seed and things growing. You can, you can read this type of uh, imagery throughout Scripture. And Jesus' followers, they've been working this out in their own life uh, since Jesus said these words. I think of the Apostle Paul. He wrote much of the New Testament. And he was I imagine that he was working out these words of Jesus in his own life when he wrote Galatians chapter 5. And if you know uh, that passage, if it's familiar to you, that's where the Apostle Paul wrote about what he called the fruits of the Spirit or the fruits of the kingdom of God in our life. Things like love, joy, patience, self-control. Maybe you're familiar with that famous passage. Well, there's, there's a version of that found in the message, the message uh, uh, which is written by Eugene P- Peterson. And he imagined these fruits of the Spirit this way. And I thought I'd, we would just slow down this morning and let's read this together and imagine that this is the fruit of the kingdom of God that's being grown in the soil of our hearts. It says this, God brings gifts into our lives much the same way that fruit appears in an orchard Things like affection for others, this is love. Exuberance about life, joy, serenity, peace. We develop a willingness to stick with things, that's patience. A sense of compassion in the heart, kindness. And a conviction that basic holiness permeates things and people goodness of God in our hearts. We find ourselves involved in loyal commitments. This is faithfulness. And not needing to force our way in life, gentleness, and able to marshal and direct our energies wisely. Self-control. Now when I slow down and I just read through those things, I think about my own experience of hearing the kingdom of God being spoken into my life, whether it be through reading scripture or maybe spoken into my life by other people. I recognize this. I recognize that there have been times that I have found all four of those soils in my heart. That the kingdom of God, when I've heard it, it, it has landed with me in different ways. You know, there's, and I don't know about you, but um, there have been times where it's the kingdom of God, the message has landed into my heart like a path where it just kind of bounces off. It didn't really stick. And uh, I didn't really pay attention to it. And like Jesus said, the birds carried it away. Or I think about in my life how there were times where I got initially excited. I heard about the joy of the Lord, for instance, and I wanted that in my life so much, and I got excited about that. Much the same as maybe, you know, I got excited about that diet craze, and then as soon as it got hard, well, I fell off the wagon of that one, you know. And I, as soon as life got hard, the joy of the Lord, I, oh, that seed didn't take root in my heart. And then there have been times where I've heard of the, the kingdom of God, like the patience and faithfulness of God, the goodness of God, But yet, I wanted those things to grow in my heart, but I was distracted by the thorns in the soil. 
of my heart. I was distracted by, like Jesus said, the worries of the world. I was distracted by things like um, my pursuit of my own happiness or my own security. And so I got caught up in, in the pursuit of wealth, something of that nature. And then there have been times when the kingdom of God, though, has landed in the fertile soil of my heart. And I've allowed that to grow. And I've allowed God's kingdom to do that work in my own heart. And it's made an impact not only in my life, but in the lives of others. It's this beautiful participation with the kingdom of God. You know, the sower, which is God, is always sowing those seeds. I love what what Paul says in Galatians 5, and I love to imagine it that way, that maybe, maybe the kingdom of God is, is like those things that Paul said, and it takes root into my heart, and it allows God to uh, bring out the, these themes of the, of the parables in a, in a way that really not only just um, impacts my heart, but really impacts the world around me, because the kingdom of God is evident in my life. And so today, as, as we think about this parable and as we think about what it means for our lives, I have a couple of questions for you to just meditate on and to reflect upon. And it's this. The first one is, where is the message of the kingdom landing with me today? Where is the message of the kingdom landing with me today? Perhaps you go back to Galatians chapter 5 and you read through that. And maybe you take a different you know, translation of the scripture and you read through that just to, just to let it sink in and say, man, this is what God desires. This is the seed that God is desiring to sow into my heart. The second question is this, and it's a real question. It's a personal question. And as you think about the soil in your own heart, what distractions can I identify in the soil of my life today? Maybe you're in a place where you would say, man, there's a lot of thorns in there. Maybe you would say, like, man, I, the kingdom of God is kind of like landing in the rocky soil of my heart. Or maybe it's just like the path. Maybe I'm like, ah, it's not really sticking with me. Maybe I can identify what are those distractions in the soil of my life. Well, church, this has been a pretty powerful um, parable for me this week to look at and to read and to sift through. And I, I encourage you to take... Take this parable and let it sift through your heart uh, this week too. Let me just pray for you. God, I'm just so grateful for these stories that are found in Scripture, especially the Gospels, the parables. Thank you for indirect communication, how it sifts down into our hearts and teaches us the truth of the kingdom of God. We love you, God, and we know that you love us. In Jesus' name, amen. See you next week, church.